Uh, Romans 7, and we're breaking in at verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, this isn't a tongue twister by the way, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, just let's check some of these questions that we're going to deal with. I'm going to have an overall view of, of chapter 8. We're not going into it in detail. It's too great a chapter uh, just to uh, deal with scantily. Notice verse number 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, 8 and 31, who can be against us? Then, of course, the, the question in verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then, of course, that lovely verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? And then, of course, that probably most famous of all questions written by Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I shall always remember as a little boy that very famous day in which Hillary and Tenzing got to the top of Everest on the coronation day of Queen Elizabeth II. Now I want you to imagine this evening uh, a man touching down or a woman touching down on the top of Everest if that were possible in a helicopter. Wouldn't you love to do that? I certainly would. Hoping it wouldn't fall off, of course, but imagine being able to fly to the top of that mountain and land on it. I don't imagine it's possible. But if it were, there would be a tremendous difference, would there not, a tremendous difference between the feeling that you would have if you got to the top of Everest by helicopter and the feeling that Hillary and Tenzing had when they got to the top of the mountain. What would be the difference of feeling? You say, well, that's easy. They'd be exhausted and I wouldn't. Well, that's true. But there would, of course, be a vast difference because although you would both stand on the same spot, the impact 
would be different upon your constitution and feeling and attitude. Why? Because those fellows had had to climb that mountain from the very bottom to the very top. All you had to do was fly. And not every Christian appreciates the magnificence of Paul's letter to the Romans. Not every Christian appreciates it. And the impact of Romans upon those who read it, who are Christians, can sometimes be very, very different. It depends very much on what has gone before. You see, the more that you are exercised with the intellectual and the moral problems of being a Christian, and many of you are, the more you will find Romans saying to you, if you have deep questions about the Christian faith, and deep questions about the authenticity of the Christian faith, and you have many, many, many problems that you have and questions you want to ask about your faith. The more you have asked those and the deeper has been your thinking about your faith, the greater will be the impact of this book upon you. Others who don't think very deeply about their faith will find the book far too intricate and very legalistic in its argument and so on. And by and large say, it's not for me. It depends upon what has gone before. Now, you know what has gone before. For nearly two, three months, you have been going through these chapters verse by verse with me. And we are now coming, of course, to the high peak of Romans. This is probably one of the greatest statements of the Christian gospel anywhere to be found. Because, of course... Um, the epistle to the Romans is a great book, but this is the very height of the book. If the epistle to the Romans is a crown, this chapter 8 is the jewel in the crown, or even the very point of the jewel in the crown. And I know it sounds very Irish, but the way into Romans 8 is to come from Romans 7. In fact, it is to come from Romans 1 to 7. If you want to get the full impact of it, you'll have to reflect what it has cost you to come to terms with the chapters we've been studying together over these months. Chapter 1 to 3, you will discover that you are lost. Physically alive and spiritually lost. That whether you're a Gentile or whether you are Jew, you are guilty before God. That's what chapter 1 to 3 is saying, and they are mighty arguments. Then, of course, there is Paul's great statement in the fourth and fifth chapter where you come to trust the promise of acceptance in the Christ who died for sinners and rose again. Chapter 4 and 5 is all about that. And only if, as a new person in Christ, you've committed yourself to total holiness uh, and following him in a holy life, and then find in yourself that there's a war going on between your own appetites, your own flesh, and spiritual things. Well, whenever that happens, you begin to find that you live in contradiction. And as you begin to live in contradiction in your life, never fully achieving the good you purposed, or avoiding the evil that you renounced, and you've had losses and crosses and strains and conflicts and all kinds of problems mentioned here, of course, even in chapter 8 towards the end. Not until you fully understand those things or in part understand those things can you really appreciate what Paul's talking about in this great chapter. It is important that you understand what goes before. But we're breaking in on what goes before at verse 14 of chapter 7 as we now come to the final little hill before we reach the summit. And it is a very difficult passage of Scripture to explain. I'm not trying to shirk that it, it's easy because it isn't easy. But I want you to notice that there is suddenly a change, as your notes will tell you, 
there is a change, point 1a on your notes, of tense in the verbs that Paul uses. In fact, suddenly he comes from the past tense into the present tense. That's why I've called the message present tense experience. In the previous paragraph, the verbs are predominantly in the past tense and refer to Paul's past experience, and now he suddenly comes into present tense experience in verse number 14. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. Notice verse number 15, for what I do I allow not, for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that I do. This is no historic thing, folks, or away in the past. He's suddenly in the present. He's saying, this is how I am right now. So you notice that quick change of tense from past to present. That's very important. Notice there's also a change of situation. In verse number 11, he is showing how sin legally slew him. But now he is beginning, you know, he says, this thing slew me. He said, that law, he says, that woke me up in the mornings and said, now look here, Paul, you love me, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. And Paul would just say, I think I'll stay in bed because I can't really do that because I'm always not keeping the law. Everybody who has tried to keep God's law knows that very well. It slays you. Nothing wrong with the law, but we ourselves don't keep it. And it's very frustrating. He says, that's what the law did to me. It slew me. It's as if the law said, don't get out of bed at all, Paul. I'll curse you for staying in there anyway if you won't get out. The law has you. And of course, here we have this situation very clearly shown that Paul is now saying, it slew me. But now he's not in the past tense saying, look, I was defeated by this thing. He says, I'm in conflict with it now. And I'm in a real conflict with sin in which I refuse to admit defeat. Credible, isn't it? He's an active combatant against this problem of evil in his life. In the former part, he was saying, it's, it slew me. That's, of course, legal. And we went into that in great detail. A legal position that the law has you. It condemns you. That's what it was for, the Bible says, to show how exceedingly sinful we are. It shows up how sinful we are. But now Paul is saying, I'm not slain. No. In fact, he's saying, I refuse to admit defeat, but I've changed situation. I'm now an active combatant. So that in one place, he changes the verbs from past to present tense experience, and in another place, he changes his situation from being slain now to really getting out there and fighting evil in his life. So these two changes uh, at once seem to suggest uh, to me that Paul is portraying in verse 7 to 13, his pre-Christian life, and then from 14 onward, he's describing his present Christian life. Because Paul was not always a Christian, of course. There are a whole lot of theologians and Bible students and expositors can't accept that. And I'm well aware that a whole lot of people don't see these verses from verse 14 on as describing a Christian. Many cannot accept it, and they can't conceive how a believer would describe their Christian experience in terms of such a fierce conflict. A conflict that they admit they can't win. And they say this paragraph must be talking about pre-Christian conflict. But as Queen Elizabeth II's chaplain, John Stott of Langham Place, in his brilliant little book, Men Made New, has made a very interesting comment, comment in his commentary. He says this. He says there are two traits here which the apostle raises in his self-portrait which lead us to be sure that this is the self-portrait of a Christian. Number one, his opinion of himself. Verse number 18. For I know that in me, that as in my flesh, 
dwelleth no good thing. And in verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am. Stott says, Who but a mature believer could talk to himself like that? The unbeliever, of course, by and large, is characterized by self-righteousness. Even immature believers sometimes are characterized by self-confidence. And they sicken non-Christians sometimes with their self-confidence. But it is the mature Christian who reaches the place where he sees that in himself or herself there is no good thing. And it is a point actually of self-despair. And of course that's the very moment where God comes in. You know our lives are just like an airplane lost contact with the airport. But when we realize that we have lost contact with God because of sin, that's the very point that God comes to help us. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of the message of the gospel. When the prodigal came to an end of himself, when he had no more schemes and no more plans to satisfy himself and live for himself, and headed back to his father that he found his father was more than willing to receive him. And my friend, if you've arrived at this point tonight, you say, look, mister, I'm in despair. I know that I have sinned against God. And I know that of myself, I cannot please God. Well, my friend, you're the very person that God wants to help to save, to forgive, to cleanse, and empower. So you have Paul's opinion of himself, and that is the opinion of a person, a mature believer. Because a mature believer, the older you become in the Christian life, the more you see that in your own heart of yourself. It's just like the prophet said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I know my own heart. And I often think of that great open-air preacher, George Whitfield of the past, who when somebody, he said, if somebody were to stand up in my congregation and say, Whitfield, I'll tell them about you and what you've been. He said, I could say, tell them, sir, and when you're finished, I'll tell them far worse, because I know my own heart, and I know my own thoughts. And of course, we see that the wonderful truth is the whole of chapter 8 is going to be about how that the Holy Spirit of God at conversion comes into a person's life and that the Spirit of God then begins to help them to keep God's commandments. The Holy Spirit of God then begins to, when they yield to him and allow him his way, then they begin to find that they get power over temptation and power over evil. They don't become sinless. Right to the very end of life, the Christian is very well aware that even his very body is waiting for redemption, as Paul says later. But of course, the whole point of this passage is that Paul is giving a mature view of himself. You know, I have a friend, he's a, a medic in Scotland, He's a consultant, and I remember after a service he said to me, you know, he says, Derek, if you just could see in Glasgow an area, he says, top medical men, when they come to the end of life with no faith in Christ, he says, those guys, he says, to see them turn to drugs and turn to alcohol to try and blitz their mind out, or whatever. So difficult. They can't face it. They reach a point where they have discovered that of themselves, you know, life itself is very disillusioning as it goes along. But that's where the gospel comes in. 
And so Paul gives us his portrait of himself. That's his opinion of himself. Then, of course, he says, Stott says, secondly, Paul's opinion of the law. And this is a good point. Notice verse 15, he calls God's law good, doesn't he? For that which I do not allow, that which I would that I do, and that which I hate um, that I do, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. And then in verse number 22, he says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I delight in it. The unbeliever does not delight in the law of God, but the believer does. And Paul says that he certainly loves God's law. His hostility is reserved for evil. So your view of this passage may not be that view. There are others who say it's neither a regenerate man nor an unregenerate person, man or woman. It is simply a person who is seeking by themselves to find God without coming through Christ and seeking by their own good works to try and please God and so on. But my view tends to this view that Paul is describing himself in his Christian life. A believer who has a clear and proper view of his own sinful flesh and of God's holy law. You see, very often when people are converted to Christ, they will come and say, look, I don't really think I'm a Christian at all because I'm aware I'm, I have cursed or I'm aware that I have done this or that or the other. And I would try to remind them if they have a real sense of sin in their lives, it is a sign, of course, that they are a believer. Unbelievers curse and blaspheme the day long and don't care two hoots about it, by and large. They can go after the appetites of the flesh and they sear their conscience and they don't listen to it. But many a believer I have talked to says, oh, wretched man that I am, or wretched woman that I am. And they say, how could I be a Christian being aware so much of sin in my life? But it is very proof positive that, of course, now that you have come to know the Lord, you are aware in your life where things are wrong, whereas before you weren't. I know a fellow used to work for the Red Sea Mission in North Africa. And, of course, way up there on the Horn of Africa, he worked for the Lord. And I heard him give his testimony as to how he came to Christian faith. And it's the rarest testimony I've ever heard. He was a pickpocket. Hope there are none in here tonight. You're not getting much out of me, folks. Or very little anyway. But, you know, he was a pickpocket. And when he was in people's homes or whatever, you know, and a thief, he used to steal things. And one evening, he went to a Christian meeting and was convicted of his need of this Savior and received Christ as Savior and Lord and became a Christian. And the next day, he was sitting in this office, in his business somewhere, calling on a man, and the boss went out of the room. And if I remember right, there was a beautiful letter opener lying right there on the desk in front of him. And over went his fingers, and he lifted it, and suddenly he couldn't do it. And he was suddenly aware of how wrong it was. And he said, you know, that was the first indication to me that I really had been changed. And that's true. You'll be tired hearing me tell this. You will. But Duncan Donaldson, my friend, the wild alcoholic or wild drunken man of Erdre, um, used to roll home drunk, kick the front door open every night, and the night he was converted to Christ, quietly opened his door. And his little dog bit him. And... <laughs> I just can't get that out of my head. I, I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment, and I was putting this into my book, and I rang up one of the elder, the elder of the church that Duncan belongs to. He's probably the most famous Christian in Erdry. Believe me, he is. And I rang him up. I said, can you check if that story is true for me? And just check the detail that his dog actually bit him. He said, Derek, if you don't hear from me within two hours, his dog bit him, and I haven't heard from him since, so it's a true story. It always, it gets to me that. It's true that Christ, when he comes into the life, he does make changes. But 
Those changes aren't a kind of a sort of that you become a supercilious, um, unreal person strutting around saying, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, and there is no sin in my life. Notice Paul's description of himself. And very many believers are like that. It's very much like Peter when he was in the boat and he saw the Lord and so on. Cast himself into the water and what were his words? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That was the conviction of his heart. The closer he got to his master, the more aware he was of the sinfulness of his own heart. And that is the Christian's experience. How many times have you come to remember the Lord and the breaking of bread or the taking of the wine, and you have sat down to remember your Lord's death, and foul thoughts have risen in your mind, and foul things in your heart, and you say, I don't want them, and I hate those thoughts. Where did they come from? The Christian is very aware of that, very aware of that. I'll never forget, you know, the night we had our 10th anniversary and one of the young men giving his testimony got up to give his testimony but apologized to a lady that he had roasted in the car park outside the Tuesday night before because she'd been parked, double parked one car on top of the other or something. I don't know what it was, but you know how you are out there. It's really quite incredible. It's a bit like a hen's roost out there getting cars in. But you know, I'll never forget that fellow. It's one of the bravest things I've ever seen anybody do. In front of 1,500 people that night, he said, I'm sorry. Now, that's exactly what this is about. Confess your faults one to another. And Paul is doing that. His opinion of himself and his opinion of the law. And this is summed up by verse 14. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. That's how I am naturally. So Paul has shown that as an unbeliever, he couldn't keep the law. And in this paragraph, he shows that even as a Christian believer, by himself, he still can't keep it. The flesh, that fallen nature, which was his undoing before his conversion, led him to sin and death. And it's still his undoing after conversion without the power of the Holy Spirit. So actually, in these verses, he's building you up for the summary truth of the power of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life. It's a very humble and a very honest acknowledgement of the hopeless evil of our flesh, even after the new birth. But that's the first step to holiness. And some of us are not leading holy lives for the simple reason we have far too high an opinion of ourselves. No man who ever cries aloud for deliverance. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? This death in verse 24. Anybody who's cried that and seen his own wretchedness, sincerely, God will answer them. The only way to arrive at faith in the power of the Holy Spirit is along the road of that in myself, of myself. I cannot do it. And that's not popular. Many psychologists would say that's terrible teaching. That's awful. People have to have confidence in themselves, and so on and so forth. Here we're talking about spiritual things. I used to be a school teacher. Of course, I would teach little Jimmy if he wrote an essay, and I'd say to him, Jimmy, that's a good essay. You've tried hard at least. A lot of spellings all over the place, and it looked as if he had done his homework with Cagney and Lacey or whatever. But, you know, despite this fact, I would say to the little lad, if there were good things in there, you've done well, son. You know, you tried there in that paragraph. Little face would brighten, and he'd write a better essay the next time. Of course, we're talking about human encouragement. We're not driving people into running around and saying, I can't do it, I'm awful, there's no hope for me. But we're talking about spiritual things here, and we're talking about pleasing God, and we're talking about the forgiveness of sins. We're talking about eternal things. We're talking about the things that really matter. Of ourselves, of ourselves, without the Lord's help, we cannot please God. So in verse 14 to verse 20, it's helpful to see that Paul is saying this twice over for emphasis. He's saying it twice over. And you'll see that. An acknowledgement of our condition in verse 14 and in verse 18. 
An acknowledgement of the conflict in verse 15 and then again in verses 18 and 19. And an acknowledgement of the cause of it all, you have it there in verse number 20. Sin. I know, I do that I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There's something desperately wrong with me. There's something desperately wrong with mankind. There is something hopelessly wrong with the condition of men and women. And Paul says, it is sin that is the cause of it. Now, that's plain and powerful and clear. You know, the prison population of England and Wales went over 50,000 on Saturday. 50,000. You think of it, we've never had more universities in one sense and higher education and brilliance and opportunity for education and what has it done? Has it emptied our prisons? It certainly has not. As we look out across the world tonight, is it a better place because of theories that have been presented by men, atheistic theories and so on? No. Sin is still rampant across our world. And Paul is saying the root cause of it is not now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he says those things twice over in that text in detail from verse 14 to verse 20. So then we come to the fact that he suddenly turns the thing into a very, Paul's a great teacher, you know, and very logical. He says, I want to put it another way. He says, what I want to do is, I want to show you that this conflict that I have within me, I want to do good and I can't do it, and those things I desire to do, I'm defeated in them and so on. There's a principle at work. And he says these principles, he begins to work out from verse 21 to verse 25. He says in verse 21, I've discovered there's a law. There's a law at work. First of all, he talks about the law of his mind. And then he talks about the law of sin. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, and I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So here you have these laws at work. There is actually a principle at work, and principles at work for this terrible conflict that a Christian has. The law of my mind, that's my will and my mind, that loves the law of God. But the law of sin is a force even in my members. My hands, my feet, my tongue, my eyes comes into my members and it hits the law of God. So it's a battle between my renewed mind and my old flesh. And the conflict is real. And the conflict is bitter. And the battle is unremitting in every Christian's experience. The Christian's mind simply delighting, as you are tonight, many of you, hundreds of you as you come, even some of you working shifts to get to this Bible class, how you love the Word of God and the things of God. In your mind, you delight in God's law, and yet you could go out that door and within two minutes, you could um, bless God with your tongue and curse the person sitting beside you. That's what, what James says in his letter. Men with their tongues bless God and curse men. On the phone tonight, you could slay somebody in gossip. You could do horrible things on someone and destroy their, their, their reputation with a word. And at every word, a reputation would die if you take several people on. Yet your mind delights in the law of God. Yet at the same time, your flesh is so real, hostile and refusing to submit to the word of God. And it's a conflict. And it really leads to apparently two contradictory cries. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 24. And then he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, well, this is strange. Who'll deliver me? I'm a wretched man. Jesus Christ our Lord will deliver me. Is it a contradiction? And then he comes to this real bumper of a point at the end of verse 25. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So anybody who thinks, yes, well, thank the Lord through Jesus Christ, our Lord, I'm freed from this body of death. 
and have no problems. They're quickly knocked down by that statement at the end of verse 25 that says, that's the way it is. My mind wants to serve the law of God and my flesh, the law of sin. And notice, friends, it's not just self-control he's fighting for. The very body of death. He's even talking about deliverance out of his own body when he dies, especially when he's clothed with a new and glorious body on the last day. He's looking not only through deliverance through his life, but deliverance out of the body into the Lord's presence in the future. But this battle raging all the time. Well, of course, no man can serve two masters. He'll either love one or hate the other, Jesus said. He's either going to serve the law of God or the law of sin. And it depends on whether my mind or my flesh is in control. So the question facing us now in this momentous passage and difficult one is, how can my mind gain ascendancy over my flesh? It's a good question, isn't it? When you go into the pornography shop, or you see soft porn before you on a video in some place you can't get out of, perhaps. It's a good question when others are ripping somebody else apart with their tongue around some table somewhere and you want to pitch in, but you know that the Lord would not have you pitch in. Good question when there is, there is conflict in this land between groups and so on and so forth to show the love of Christ, even to enemies, when your flesh wants to kill them. Very difficult. This is a very great question. Is it possible for my mind to gain ascendancy over my flesh? I have to ask myself that every day, and I'm sure you do. You see, you've got to understand what comes before so that you can now understand this incredible panorama, panoramic view you're going to see now of the Christian gospel. As he now comes out over this lower peak, he goes up the top and he gets to the very summit. In fact, I think this is one of the great summits of all the Bible. There is. Therefore. Oh, therefore. All this war and all this trouble going on between my mind and my flesh. There is, therefore, he says, four gifts that God gives to a person who trusts Jesus Christ. And this is straight and plain and powerful. This is the greatest message that the world can hear. Four gifts that are given to the one who trusts Christ. Listen, the first one is the gift of righteousness. You say, what? Me righteous before God? Yes. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, that is an absolute. There is therefore now no condemnation. No means never. It is absolute in the Greek. This is the Christian standing. This is the Christian status. And the devil will come along to you and try to make you feel ashamed and say, ah, look at that war that's going on between your mind and your flesh all the time. <laughs> how could you be a believer? And how could you really know the Lord? Well, you just quote this verse to Satan. Resist, says Paul the devil, and he will flee from you. And as Luther said, and he had it right, he said, you know, I can't stop the birds building nests. But he said, I can at least, he said, stop them building nests in my hair. Not that anyone would want to have any in mind, I'm sure. But what a point he's trying to make. And the devil would want to plant thoughts in your mind and in your heart and say, oh, look at this war that's going on between your mind and your flesh and these laws of sin and death and this law of life in Christ and so on. How could you really be a Christian? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. This is the foundation of everything. 
I am a guilty sinner. But Jesus died for me. Why, says Paul, says the Bible, God loved the world. That's great. Why, says Paul, Christ loved the church. That's terrific. But, says the apostle, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And to as many as received him, that is Christ, says John in his gospel, to them gives he, if I can paraphrase it, the right and the privilege to become Christians. To as many as received him, to them gives he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And if you're in Christ tonight, my friend, the law can't condemn you, God's law, because Christ has kept it and paid the price for your sin by shedding his blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, says John in his first letter, God's Son cleanseth us from all sin. So you can't be condemned. Righteous, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I often think of Augustine, you know. And Augustine was a very immoral young man. But he could find no satisfaction through the dissipation of his sexual appetites. Then he decided he would try and become a brilliant academic, and he became a professor of philosophy in North Africa or in Italy. But for all his brilliance in academic life, he could find no peace. Then he decided he'd become a monk, an asceticism and so on, and he went out and he sat in a garden and wearing his habit and so on and give up the pleasures of the flesh and the world, it would seem. And there he was sitting underneath a tree and somebody had asked, told him, read the epistle to the Romans. And he read those marvelous words which say, you know, make not provision for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says how that sitting under that tree that day, he put on Christ. That is, clothed in Christ's righteousness. The great Christian truth of substitution. He stood in my place and died for me, and now I stand in him, safe and cleansed. No condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's a very powerful word, isn't it? This is the foundation of everything in the Christian life. And if you're not in Christ tonight, my friend, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned, said Jesus. You hear this glorious message and refuse it and deny it and tramp over it, you, my friend, will discover the greatest barrier to hell is the cross of Calvary. But if you walk past it, you'll perish. That's what the Word says. But God's love goes out to you tonight and says, flee to Christ. As the Christian hymn writer, the Anglican clergyman, top lady, who wrote Rock of Ages, cleft for me, did he not? What was he saying in that marvelous hymn? Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin that double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. No condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's a gift. Why not take that gift tonight and stand before God in Christ, not in your own righteousness? So that's the first gift that overcomes these great problems of chapter 7. But the second gift, and I don't have time to go into it all, from verse 4 to 27, we'll do that in September in the will of the Lord. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you enter into union with Christ, you will discover a new power, a new rule in your life. The rule of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Spirit brings life and power and sustains you and gives you deliverance from the law of sin and death. Verse 14, for we know that the law, or verse 14 of chapter 8, for many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And ye have not received 
or sorry, verse 4 rather, the righteousness, 8 and 4, the righteousness of the law, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, verse 7 of chapter 8, is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh. What has happened? Into your life has come the Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body, of, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit, capital S, that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we're not debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye'll die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as be led of the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, or dear Father the Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit, small s, that we are the children of God. Do you know that at 12 o'clock today from Gatwick in West Sussex, a zillion horsepower machine took off. A zillion horsepower. It's even faster than my Peugeot. A zillion horsepower. At 12 o'clock today, Piedmont flight, P1161. And they're not paying me any commission. Their first inaugural flight from Gatwick and the first link between Britain and a regular service, as I understand it, in history, between uh, Gatwick up to 36,000 feet at 600 mile no, miles an hour. Where did, where did it go? It went to uh, Charlotte in North Carolina. Think of it, a zillion horsepower, 36,000 feet, at 600 miles an hour, from Gatwick to Charlotte, North Carolina. That's pretty different. That's pretty different from that December morning 84 years ago when Orville Wright and his brother Wilbur braved the sheets of ice and waves of indifference. And near the village of Kitty Hawk in North Carolina went out to the sands and put the village of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina into the history books. For on those nearby sands Orville flew his chain-driven 12 horsepower flyer one for how long 12 seconds bigara 12 seconds at what height 12 feet <laughs> at what speed airspeed 30 miles per hour wow didn't he do well well done Orville and as Brother Wilbur, he turned to the rest of the audience present at that very epoch-making event, four men and a schoolboy. And he is reputed to have asked, would any of you have the right time? And they said, yes, Wilbur, it's 10.35 a.m., so that at 10.35 a.m., 84 years ago, that amazing machine, and I've seen a replica of it, if not it, at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, it's uh, quite, a, quite a thing. Some machine, I wouldn't like to have lain on the top of her like Wilbur did, literally, on his stomach. No steak served up or whatever, I can tell you. Those fellas flew into history. What happened? 
Well, as Alan Redpath showed us one famous evening here from the Word, the law of gravity had for thousands of years held men to the earth. But those two fellas who ran a bicycle shop, keep your eye on fellas who run bicycle shops, they discovered another law called the law of aerodynamics. And albeit, yes, they went 12 feet at 12 seconds at 12 horsepower, 30 miles an hour. They had two days before put that machine's nose into the sand and it failed. But on that morning, they lifted for those 12 feet and they changed history and showed the world, in fact, that the law of aerodynamics took over from the law of gravity and lifted that machine, flyer one. That's exactly what happens in the Christian's life. The law of sin and death holds them down. And the power of sin that Paul is talking about in the seventh chapter is chaining them down and so on. Then what happens? The law of the spirit of life in Christ comes into a life. And what happens? You have liftoff. There is a power available to you to overcome evil thoughts and a wicked tongue and a vile temper and selfish attitudes. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say, now all try and be good, boys and girls, and do your best. And go to church now and read your Bible and be good. Show me it. What the Bible says is that you come to Christ in all of your needs and trust him as your savior and he'll give you the power to do it. Christianity is not a message of turning over a new leaf. There are millions of people across the world who can turn over a new leaf and have turned over new leaves. This is not a message of turning over a new leaf. This is a message which puts power in your life that really does turn over a new leaf, not by your power, but by Christ's power. He, when he comes into a life, transforms life. That's what he's saying. And if he can't do it, friend, then I'd better quit and we'd better close this down, this place, and forget it. If he can't do what he claims to do. But of course he can. It is not your works that will save you, but faith without works is dead. A person comes to your door and they're naked and blind and hungry and so on and so forth. And you say to them, the Lord bless you. You're a hypocrite. Bible says. You have to be kind to those people, etc. But that kindness and that goodness will not give you so many marks with God because we have all come short of the glory of God. No matter how good we are, we need a righteousness which meets God's demands. And Christ, says Paul, is our righteousness. That's the gift. And then the Holy Spirit comes into your life with that tremendous law of life in Christ and helps you and gives you power to overcome that sinful flesh within. What a fantastic thing. Paul says in verses 9 and 10, <laughs> you used to be under that power of the flesh constantly, didn't you? But now you're in the Spirit. And that means you have to have a ruthless rejection now that you know Christ of practices you know to be wrong. And the only attitude to the flesh is to kill it. Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Does that mean literal? Well, no. What he, of course, is saying very simply in modern day language is if you go into, for example, some place and a person is using raw sexuality in art and you know that that is not good for you to watch or that picture for you to look at or that which arouses something in you that is sinful. Sex in itself, of course, is not sinful. It wasn't invented in Hollywood. It was God who invented it and sacred and wonderful as it is within marriage. But sometimes Christians and Christian young people have to find in reading novels, even on courses that they have to do and so on and so forth, they have to stand up and have a cultural amputation for the cause of Christ. 
and stand against it. Oh, how I used to preach the gospel in my English classes through D.H. Lawrence. If you've ever read any of his books, well, you'll know what he was about in many things. Brilliant writer. You know, I used to see the gospel in Hardy. Thomas Hardy's one of my favorite novelists. He's a tremendous writer. But you know, Hardy's, he's, his, his novels are just filled with hopelessness. That fate, if it's against you, will get you. And it'll break you. It's hopeless. It's brilliant, but it's hopeless. The Christian, even when they are reading that on a course or facing what these men are saying or whatever, they have to stand up and declare where they are. They may believe that, but look what the Christian gospel says. It needn't be fatalistic, a fatalistic philosophy. It needn't be sheer physical pleasure that men live for or whatever. There's a far greater thing. And you stand against the tide. That's what Christians are. Light in a dark place. That's what they are. Salt, said Jesus, in rotten meat. And he was making some comment about society when he said that Christians were the light of the world. He never even mentioned Aristotle or Plato, the brilliant philosophers of their day. He says, you, Peter, and you two sons of thunder over there, and so on, you are the light of the world. How could it be? He realized that those two fellows who were his disciples, if they disagreed with anybody, they said, Lord, would you send down fire in that village? They don't agree with us. Don't vote our way. Wipe them out. Well, that's the Northern Ireland version, maybe. <laughs> but you know what I mean. And yet Jesus said, you men are the light of the world. How could these men be the light of the world? Because his power was within them. And the Holy Spirit, when it came at Pentecost, empowered them to be the light of the world and salt and rotten meat. And that's what you are when the Spirit comes into your life. He subdues the flesh as you fortify it in his power. And you set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Third gift, of course, is sonship. You're adopted into the divine family in which the Lord Jesus is the preeminent one. I was preaching with Dick Lucas at Keswick this year. Dick Lucas has a very famous Bible class at St. Helens in London, right in the middle of the city. And he gets about a thousand stockbrokers or whatever to his Bible class at lunchtime. And in fact, he has to have two meetings. One lot go out and the other lot come in halfway through. And he went in to buy something in a shop, I'll never forget this, and when he went into the shop, he told us a little Jewish boy came in, and his dad had a little Jewish cap on, and a little Jewish boy went away down to the other end of that, uh, that store. And Dick Lucas, like most preachers, was looking for a bargain, and he was looking around, and the little Jewish boy was wet the other end, and his father was here, and suddenly a little lad shouted from one end to the other of the store, Abba! And Dick Lucas, knowing his Bible, you know, bowed his heart right there and worshipped. Because it is a little Jewish child's cry for dear father. And this is exactly what Paul is saying in verses 17 to 19, 16. You're the children of God. The Spirit bears witness of that. And if you're children, verse 17, you're heirs. And if you're heirs of God, you're joint heirs with Christ. If so be we suffer with them, we'll also be glorified together. Sonship. You're a member of the family. You come into God's family on acceptance of Christ. That's very clear, and the Spirit of God makes you that. What a marvelous thing. And then, of course, there's another gift. All things work together for good, verse 28, to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You've got security. Security. Christians don't believe in luck. I said that in a church on Sunday evening in this land. Building, preached on it. I said, Christians don't believe in luck. And a fellow came to me afterwards, a tall, or an older man, he says, have you ever played golf? <laughs> you ever played golf? He couldn't really get around to this fact that Christians didn't believe in luck because he reckoned a lot of those shots were very lucky. But in fact, Christians do not believe in luck. You'll not find it in Scripture. The security that we know that although all things that happen to us are not good, they work together for good. Think of those gifts. Righteousness, the power of the Spirit to subdue your flesh. And if you yield to Him, it'll be subdued. And if you don't, you'll have trouble in your Christian life. 
If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, my brother and sister, you will reap the Spirit. What are you sowing to? What are you reaping? You're his children. You are secure. So then, is it any wonder the apostle draws his breath and said, well, what are you going to say to that then? What on earth will we say to these things? Well, he's saying, I'm going to say, and I hope you'll say too, and all believers with us. I know what I'm going to say. What will you say? What will we say to these seven chapters now building to this tremendous summit that you have these gifts and this law of the spirit of life in Christ that comes into your life, subduing that flesh of yours and giving you power to live the Christian life, power like power you've never known before as you yield to him. What are you going to say to it? What shall we say? What shall we say? He's calling on his readers to use their brains and think. Think, he says. Think. What will you say? He wants the Christian to now go and possess his possessions. He wants you to go and take the Christian's birthright, which is hope and joy in God's love. It's not those things. It's what are we going to say to these things, these powerful, alive things in the Christian's life. Think, he says. Think against your feelings. Argue yourself out of the gloom that's spread in your life. Unmask the unbelief that you've nourished. Take yourself in hand. Talk to yourself. Make yourself look up from your problems to the God that you have trusted. Let evangelical thinking replace emotional thinking. Is there a depressed believer listening to me just now? What are you going to say, my friend? Is there someone going through the change of life listening to me now? Think about this, my dear friend. Is there somebody who's just lost their job and you say, this is terrible, there's no hope for me? Somebody maybe feared, you failed an exam or something, and you're really frightened. What are you going to say in the light of this? Is it relevant or is it a lot of moonshine? Does it really work? Or is it just theological talk? <laughs> well, Paul says, I'll, I'll, I'll just get you to focus. What are you going to say? I'll get, get you to focus on, on, on two or three wee questions. Uh, if God be for us, he says, who can be against us? Think about that. You know what C.S. Lewis said? God never plays philosopher with the washerwoman. And if you want to see how God condescends, you just note how God listens to prayer. Whatever your need, he listens. There are some fellows in this land, you couldn't get them to stop for five minutes to listen to your problem. They wouldn't have the time for you anyway. They wouldn't take the time. Thank God there are others who do and stop and let everything go until you're helped. But my friend, you'll find God's ear always open to your cry. If that God's for you, what are you worried about? Look at his condescension. Look at God's eternity. He'll never die and he'll never lie. Think of his existence. The Bible doesn't prove the existence of God. The Bible assumes it. God is his own best evidence. As I was going to say, his existence can't be proved and should not be attempted. You can't put God in a test tube and say, there he is. Can't put him in a mathematical formula and say, there he is. Why, the Bible starts off in the beginning. God. Think of his existence. The fool has said, says the Bible in his heart, there is no God. Think of God's faithfulness. You've proved a whole lot of people in these months to be false. Have you proved God to be false? Think of God's glory. You know, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. You refuse to worship him, friend, that'll not diminish his glory one bit. There is nothing little in God God hasn't got any weak points. 
because he hasn't got any strong ones. He's perfectly balanced. You think of God's goodness. <laughs> I was down near the mumbles and wheels one day and I saw a wee sign. I jammed on the brakes or got the driver to do it of the car I was in. Saw a sign, Francis Ridley Havergal, great hymn writer. And I stopped there and I just looked at that lovely house there near the sea and I thought of what that woman wrote. You know what she said? She said, if I could write about the goodness of God to me as I would write, the ink would boil in my pen. His love is no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. From out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That God be for you. Who can be against you? Think of his inscrutability. Man can find God, but nobody can fathom him. You ever met anybody who could fathom God? If you could comprehend God tonight, my friend, he would stop being God. He would cease to be God. He's incomprehensible. He's great without quantity. He's everlasting without time, containing all things without extent. And think of his love. God's love isn't lazy good nature, you know as a great many people think it to be and drag it in the mud. God's love is righteous, rigidly righteous. That's why Christ died. I walk down a hospital ward and I look on a little child who's sick and I pity that wee one. But God just doesn't pity us. God loves us. That God should love the world and not just pity the world is a thing that staggers me. And of that God be for you, who can be against you? Think about it, says Paul. What are you going to say to that? That's covenant language. He's committed to you. He'll not overlook your need. Paul, in this passage, is standing up. And what's he doing? He's seeking to quell panic. He is countering fear. Think, says Paul, God's for you. Now, if there's somebody against you, just measure them up against this God and how do they stand? How did the two sides compare? Take a realistic view of the opposition that's in your life. Please, do this. Take a realistic view of the thing that's frightening you and scaring you, whether it's human or demonic. Are you afraid of the opposition? You needn't be. Here is freedom from fear and strength to fight. If God's for you, who can be against you? It's not saying that nobody's against you. It's saying, who can stand against you and break you? It's impossible. And then he says, if he didn't spare his own son but delivered him up for us, how will he not freely with him give us all things? If God has given you Jesus to die on the cross, my friend, this unspeakable, incredible gift, would he not give you lesser gifts? The cross proves God's generosity. Will he not freely with Christ give you all things? You say, does that mean all things? Well, you know it means all the things that are good for you. Everything good that God can think for you, he'll give you. Not everything good that you think. I thought it was good to go to New Zealand, but God said, no, it's not New Zealand. You thought it was good to take up business, but God moved you into that one. You thought you should teach in that school, but God had you over here. You thought you should serve God in that spot, but God brought circumstances that squeezed the very life out of you and say, hey, what's going on here? What on earth is happening to me? Why am I in this narrow circumstance? And all the time, God was working out something. He had good for you and good for you. Oh, yes. All things that are good for you, he'll give you. And if he's given Christ to die on the cross, how shall he not freely with him give you all things? And no good thing will he withhold from you if you walk uprightly. Let's call a spade a spade, my friend. 
If God denies us something, it's only in order to make room for one or other things that he has in his mind. Do you fear God's strength or his wisdom? No. Do you fear that God's infirm of purpose? No. Do you fear his constancy? You say no. God is adequate for your every need. And you will never need more than he can supply. And what he supplies, both materially and spiritually, will always be enough for the present. Enough for the present. A fellow came into my house on Friday. He brought me a big gammon. Oh, it was delicious. He brought some roast meat. And he gave it to my wife and he beat it off down the road quickly. Didn't want to disturb the preacher, he thought. But I ran out and stopped him on the road. I said, hey, Philip, come on in. Got to have a coffee for a gammon anyway, for at least. <laughs> or whatever. And he sat down. I just told him how we were that day. Oh, he just had some meat left over and he thought he would give it to us. But there was more to it than that. And I tried to tell him that. See, God can supply, can supply both materially and spiritually enough for the present. No good thing will he withhold. Now, says Paul, will you think about those things? If God's for you, who can be against you? If he gave Christ, will he not freely with him give you all things? He will. He will. And who lay anything to the charge of God's elect, he asks? Nobody. It's inconceivable that justification can be taken away from you. From whence, wrote top lady, this fear and unbelief. Hath not the Father put to grief his spotless Son for me? And will the righteous judge of men condemn me for that sin which Lord was charged to thee? complete atonement thou hast made and to the utmost farthing paid whate'er thy people owed nor can his wrath on me take place if sheltered in thy righteousness and sprinkled with thy blood if thou hast my discharge procured and freely in my room endured the whole of wrath divine payment God cannot twice demand first at my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine Turn then my soul unto thy rest. The merits of thy great high priest hath brought thee liberty, thy liberty. Trust in his efficacious blood, nor fear thy banishment from God, since Jesus died for thee. Now, says Paul, will you tell me, think about this, who can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Many a Phyllis set out to give his wife everything his heart desired to give her, but he wasn't able to do it. I had some letters in recently from this Bible class or notes saying, I can't provide for my wife and my children. I can hardly make ends meet. It's not that they don't want to. But when divine love sets out to give you something, it can't be thwarted. Can't be. You can't say of God like the cartoonist little woman or young girl sitting with a thistle down, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Can't do that with God. Who can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? I am convinced, says Paul. I am persuaded. He's countering fear, fear of the unknown. Whether you have unprecedented suffering, notice that, unprecedented suffering, tribulation, distress, persecution, or the world change because of famine, and we've known that, or nakedness, or peril, or war, or sword, unprecedented problems in the world, as it shall be. Even should you starve, even should you die by the sword, even should you have trouble, the Bible doesn't hide its head in the sand. 
says if you're in Christ, there is nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if there's cosmic forces, you know, neither height nor depth, do you know that those are technical astrological terms for mysterious cosmic powers? Well, we have a lot of that at the moment, from Russell Grant up or down. The focus of fear that even people are going back to astrology and trying to measure the future, and millions in Britain are turning to it, and it's served up to us on television every morning virtually. People looking to the stars instead of to God, who graciously shields us from the future and says, I'll handle it. You just trust me. The focus of fear is the effect these things might have on your fellowship with God. Overwhelming, are you scared that problems will overwhelm your reason and your faith and destroy your sanity? My friend, don't you be afraid. Even if your mind gives way, even if they take your house from you, fire destroys it. Illness comes to your body. Say, what will happen then? Nothing, literally nothing, can separate us from the love of God. Because in all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. No calamities of life. No superhuman agencies. No good or bad. No time nor space or anything else in all creation, will be able, however hard it might try, to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in that kind of conviction of the love of God, through all the pains and perplexities of human experience, that you and I both want to live and die, right? By the grace of God. Shall we pray? Father, it's been good to look at your mighty word in crisis deaths, and we pray your deep blessing upon your word and upon our lives. Thank you for this very patient congregation, many of them going through desperate and tough times in their lives. Use thy lovely word to convict them tonight to yield to the Spirit those who have trusted Christ, power over the flesh, and those who haven't, may they do so, and come to know the love of God in a way that they never imagined before. Father, we pray you'll use your word and bless it. In Jesus' name, amen.